severe mental illness and an intellectual disability held in jail for months, often in solitary confinement. We're not identifying him to protect his privacy. But tonight, a new Carol Levin investigation reveals he's just one example of tragic failures in Minnesota's mental health and juvenile justice systems. Failures that, as Lauren Lemanchek reports, puts us all at risk. Behind these walls, a teenage boy was held alone in isolation day after day, night after night. And he's very scared. For up to two weeks at a time, the only way his mother Kilva or anyone else could talk to the boy who was suicidal and sometimes violent was through a six by 18 inch slit in a metal door. I had to go visit him through this metal door with this little bitty like little latch on it. And so he's like down on the floor, we're down on the floor talking through a latch. He was on what is called a no contact isolation. His attorneys, Tracy Reed and Angela Bailey, longtime public defenders, have seen a lot. But what they saw this summer at the Hennepin County Juvenile Detention Center shocked even them. Are those humane conditions? No. I was appalled. An example, they say, of how Minnesota's juvenile justice system is failing victims and failing kids. Life has never been easy for Kielva's son. This is how I lived for three years. A car his home for years. We slept on top of each other. Piled in on top of his mom and five siblings. This is what kept us warm. In elementary school, signs of mental illness. He was jumping out of my moving vehicle, running into traffic. By 11, a social worker called his symptoms unprecedented. Eventually diagnosed with ADHD, conduct disorder, mood dysregulation, intellectual disabilities, and PTSD. Was it possible for your son to get mental health treatment while you were living in these conditions? No, it was not. At 12, charged with aggravated robbery. And since then, a cycle. Charged with at least a dozen more crimes, including aggravated robbery, fleeing police, assault, and gun possession. But never convicted. Each time, his severe mental illness led a judge to find him incompetent to stand trial. There were some attempts at treatment with limited options here in Minnesota. At 13, the boy was sent to a facility down in Missouri, but often he was just released back to his mother's care, only to be arrested again for more incidents of violence, making care providers even less likely to treat his illness. They are either unable or unwilling to take children with aggressive behaviors. All have rejected Kielva's son. Now 16, he was arrested again this summer and stuck for months in juvenile detention, where records show he was consistently on suicide watch. The day that I met him in the JDC, staff asked me if I could get him to stop saying that he was going to kill himself in the facility. But that just begs the question, why isn't this kid being placed in a psychiatric facility? His lawyers suggested the only secure psychiatric hospital for children in all of Minnesota, located in Wilmer. But it's not even an option. Why not? A CARE 11 investigation finds while he and other kids languish without treatment, most of the beds at this mental health hospital are empty. Turns out taxpayers pumped $39 million to expand and operate that hospital. Two hours from the Twin Cities in a town with a population of 21,000. And now the state says it can't hire enough people to staff it. Even though records show it's officially licensed to handle 16 kids, right now it's treating an average of just three kids at a time. It all adds up to this. Kids like Kielva's son, who has twice punched guards, sitting in isolation. It's making his mental health illness worse. If you are putting a child with mental illness in isolation, what is that going to do to their general behavior? Well, it's not going to improve it. Brett Peterson, who oversees juvenile detention in Utah and is president of the Council of Juvenile Justice Administrators, says it impacts us all. If you have a young person and they're placed into an institutional setting without the right type of treatment and care, they are not going to come out better because of that. 
Hennepin County refused an on-camera interview and would not address their use of isolation. In a statement, the county said, we know the current juvenile justice system isn't perfect, but we're committed to the safety and well-being of all youth who are under our supervision, adding they also must respect the safety and well-being of the JDC staff. And it's just going to make them worse as far as when he comes out. After nearly three months in the JDC, Kilva and her son's attorneys faced a decision. They knew he couldn't be released, but they wanted him out of the JDC. There was no treatment available except at the juvenile prison in Red Wing. So despite his mental illness, they agreed to say he's competent, admit to a prior charge, and be sent to prison. He definitely needs help. Yes, he does. And it's nowhere to be found. In this case, going to prison just to get some treatment. But it's not just this case. Experts estimate around 70% of the kids in the juvenile justice, justice system have a diagnosed mental health disorder. And too often, treatment just isn't available. So what's the solution here? Well, Julie and Randy, for one thing, mental health advocates are going to be pushing the legislature for a new facility here in the metro. That's something that they're going for. As for that underused hospital out in Wilmer, tomorrow night we are going to be talking to the lawmaker who pushed to keep that in his district, and he has some ideas about how to improve staffing there. Yeah, I mean, that's maddening to hear they could have 16 and there's such a need and they can well, only handle three. And the fact mm -hmm. that if you're pushing for a new facility in the metro, that's not going to be here overnight. No. Yeah, I mean, so now you're time. talking about some even more time to figure out what to do with all these kids. Yeah, and, and these kids are languishing. It puts everyone at risk. It's failing teens. It's failing our whole community. Well, great oh. reporting. Thanks, mm -hmm. Lauren. Now to the latest on the controversy surrounding the city's handling of Rikers Island. The Correction Officers Union is speaking out after two of its members were brutally attacked this week. As CBS 2's Lisa Rosner reports, it comes during the same week the Department of Correction announced another inmate died while in custody. The injuries to this correction officer Tuesday are the result of what the Department of Correction called a detainee disturbance in the intake area of a Rikers Island facility. Broken orbital, broken nose. This is what's happening to us now. Monday, the correction officers union said another officer was stabbed in the head 15 times by a detainee, alleging it's one of 1,500 assaults on officers since January. Monday's stabbing happened just hours after a 26-year-old died while in custody. So far, 18 inmates have died while in custody or shortly after being released from Rikers this year. Our hearts go out to the family members of anybody that dies in our custody. But the city council has defunded us. You have one officer in a housing area with approximately 50 inmates. They look to see what is it that the correction officer did wrong. The union says it wants to extend the time it separates violent inmates from the rest from seven hours to 16 hours. But legislation from the public advocate would actually limit that time to four hours. The legislation, which has not yet passed through a council committee, also would only allow it, if necessary, to de-escalate immediate conflict that has caused injury or poses a specific, serious, and imminent danger to a person's safety. Keith Taylor was an assistant commissioner for the DOC from 2015 to 2017. It is extremely uh, detrimental for their safety. And something that's being left out of this conversation completely is organized crime within uh, Rikers Island. Some groups have called on ending the practice altogether, saying it worsens the condition for people with mental illness and makes it an even more dangerous environment. In Elmhurst, Queens, Lisa Rosner, CBS 2 News. And earlier in the year, a federal judge considered ordering a federal takeover of Rikers. Some are now calling on her to reconsider, given that the increasing death toll and the increasing assaults on officers is taking place. A day of action coming to a close tonight. Yes, yeah, hundreds honored the 18 lives that were lost while in custody behind bars at Rikers this year. And News 12's Mary Lynn Buckley, she joins us right now from outside of City Hall Park. And you spoke, Mary Lynn, with mothers at that vigil tonight whose children died in Department of Correction custody. Amanda, that's right. 
dozens of those mothers were here and we want to show you this very powerful uh, demonstration. You can see these are just a few of the body bags here. 18 body bags put here to represent the 18 lives lost. 18 people died in Rikers Island just this year alone and like we were saying this vigil is continuing. We want to show you there's still a decent crowd here right now. They are watching a documentary of the conditions inside of Rikers. The conditions that so many of the family members Members, talk to us about tonight. Hundreds coming together, honoring the lives lost and taking to the streets, demanding Mayor Adams shut Rikers doors for good. This has to be a collective effort for us to continue in this work. Families need our help. Body bags laid out here with the names of the victims each written out too as family members and even complete strangers bringing flowers. Mothers of these victims speaking out tonight. My son died September 22nd, 2021, 11 days after his birthday. I got a call and they basically said my son was dead. Lysandra Cadu says her son was just 24 years old when he passed away inside of Rikers. She, like many other mothers here tonight, want more to be done, including an investigation internally with the Department of Corrections. Could do sending a powerful message to Mayor Adams. Mayor, do something. I, I mean, when are you going to do something when it's your loved one there? My loved one lost their life in there and all these people lost their loved ones in there and no one is being held accountable. Mayor, you have to do something. And right now, a vigil is still ongoing here. You can see many people watching that documentary. And when we did reach out prior to this vigil to the mayor's office, they referred us to the Department of Corrections that tell us at this time they are working around the clock to improve conditions inside of Rikers. But as of now, they did also say they're extending their condolences to the families, but no one has a, right now commented on whether or not Rikers will close going forward. That's the very latest right here in Lower Manhattan. I'm Mary Lynn Buckley. News 12. That day of action continues at this hour, Mary. Dr. Webster, his attendance was sporadic at best, and um, his lack of attendance interfered with the integrity of operations at the facility itself. Today, a blistering Inspector General report confirms a string of hard-hitting eyewitness investigations. Investigative reporter Mike Perlstein was the first to report on that controversial tenure of Kishan Webster as a director of New Orleans Juvenile Jail. Mike showed you as employees complained about Webster's leadership and absenteeism and even revealed Webster's deal with the city to spend time on the clock running his own business. Well, this morning, the New Orleans Inspector General issued a report chronicling those same issues, but the report also included some surprises. And before it's released, we also got Webster to break his long-standing silence in a sit-down with Mike. During Keyshawn Webster's three and a half years as the director of the Juvenile Justice Intervention Center, JJIC, there was no shortage of employee complaints. And if it's not to his satisfaction, he's going to once again, go off and start yelling and screaming. And the conditions become uh, uncomfortable. Some people are just ran off, and, and that's the honest truth. And would you say he berated employees? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Big time. Profanity? Profanity. He's used it to me. Shortly after Mayor LaToya Cantrell elevated Webster from interim to permanent director in 2019, he came up with a solution that would mute the employee's complaints. He decided to have his office soundproof. Records obtained by Channel 4 show that Webster not only ordered the soundproofing, but sent this angry email to the building superintendent when the project was slow to get started. The email begins, my patience is growing short. Records show that the total cost of the project was more than $16,000. I simply shut my door and I lower my voice. I don't have to spend $15,000 in city resources to soundproof my office. Inspector General Ed Michel included that finding among several others in the report entitled Allegations of Neglect of Duty, Misuse of City Property, and Abuse of Office by Keyshawn Webster. Other findings include Webster's spotty attendance and the questionable introduction of Webster's personal pet into the lockup to be used as a service dog. On Webster's attendance, the report states, quote, 
The complainants allege that Keyshawn Webster does not report to work on a regular basis and his absenteeism is affecting the operation of the JJIC. Again, I don't see that this is a job that you can do part-time. It, it requires boots on the ground all the time. The IG found that over a one-year period through October 2021, Webster's electronic key card was used only 13 times to enter the building. Webster told an IG investigator that he bypassed the electronic system much of the time, but he defended his work attendance. As for running an outside business... So it was no secret that I had other business interests, so we followed all of the city rules with disclosing that I had uh, business interests. Channel 4 revealed that this letter of termination for Webster was drafted on January 13th, the day after four teenagers escaped from the lockup. But it was never delivered, and Webster ended up taking a leave of absence from the $143,000 a year job on March 18th and resigned for good on April 29th. Three days later, he began working as a consultant for newly elected Sheriff Susan Hudson and was paid nearly $37,000 for about five weeks of work. We later learned about the soundproofing of Webster's office through a public records request. That became another item in the IG's report. Webster conceded that he has a loud voice, but... That had nothing to do just with my voice, mm -hmm. which it had to do with faulty construction. As for Webster's dog Lacey being brought to the JJIC, the report questions why public resources were spent on a sickly and incontinent dog that was not a trained service animal and generated, quote, multiple complaints by employees. An attempt to get the JJIC to pay a veterinary bill for the dog was rejected and the dog was ultimately put down. Webster, however, defended using Lacey for, quote, pet therapy, saying he received permission from the city. He also strongly defended his tenure as JJIC director. The goal was to transform the facility from being a punitive to a rehabilitative facility, which I believe we achieved, and the data bears that out. Webster shared this 82-page report on the JJIC with pages of statistics showing significant progress, from more detainees attending school to fewer involved in altercations. Did he rub some people the wrong way in making changes? And again, I wasn't hired to win a popularity contest. I was hired with a job and a focus to create change. Mike Perlstein, Eyewitness News. And now the city's official response to the report was a brief note from CAO Gilbert Montano stating that all employees of the JGIC, including the director, must now adhere to strict security guidelines, which include electronic records of everyone who enters the building. Katie and Cherise. All right, Mike, thank you so much for that update in that investigation. Correction officers stabbed repeatedly while on the job at Rikers Island. A law enforcement source tells Eyewitness News he has 15 stab wounds and is in the hospital in serious but stable condition. It happened around 445 yesterday afternoon. The Department of Corrections calls it a callous, unprovoked attack. The incident under investigation right now. The accused inmate was re-arrested. Well, family from Italy is demanding justice after their son took his own life while studying here in New York. The parents of Claudio Mendia blame the high school he attended for administering what they claim is too harsh of a punishment after their son was accused of cheating. Eyewitness News reporter Marcus Solis has more from Thornwood. The level of cruelty uh, is almost unspeakable. Alleged cruelty that devastated parents say drove their son to suicide. In February, Claudio Mandia hanged himself at EF Academy, a private boarding school in Thornwood. The 17-year-old was expelled for cheating on an assignment. According to the lawsuit, Mandia was ordered out of his dorm room and moved to a stark bare room, placed in what his lawyers call solitary confinement until his parents could come from Italy to pick him up. And Claudio was placed in this room and he was forbidden to leave the room without seeking the permission of EF officials. Mandia was a senior at the school, which caters to international students preparing for college in the U.S. Enjoying the experience so much, his younger sister enrolled as well. They liked so much to have friends in Mexico or in South Korea. They planned to, 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 to travel, to go and see each other. 
But in January, Mandia was two weeks late returning to campus because of COVID. Lawyers say he was battling the stress of falling behind in the academically rigorous program while mourning the death of a relative back home. Lawyers say Mandia should have never been placed in isolation, a practice prohibited in the criminal justice system for minors and not allowed in public schools. And yet, EF Academy is subject to no such statutory or regulatory restriction. To us, that is shocking. In a statement, EF says Mandia was, quote, in an unlocked student dorm room. At no time was he placed in solitary confinement without social interactions or access to other resources and facilities. The family is calling for Claudio's Law, which would hold private schools to the same regulatory standards as public schools. In the meantime, the Westchester District Attorney's Office is investigating whether criminal charges should be filed.